This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, I now I declare the meeting open open to the public. Um, can I just start by saying, uh, just, just so that everybody is clear, I want to advise you all that there are four members attending the meeting here today in person and five members attending via teleconferencing. The following members are present here in person, including myself, are Jonathan Buckley, Kelly Armstrong and Andy Allen. The following members are attending via teleconferencing. That's Mark Durkin, Carol McCullen, Fran McCann, Sinead Innes and Robin Newton. Um, I would ask all members to refrain from using their mobile phones during the meeting, given the potential interference with the teleconferencing facilities. It is especially important that we adhere to this today, so please turn off uh, your mobile phone where possible. I will then move on to agenda, agenda item number one, which is apologies. We have no apologies for today, so I can move on to item number two, which is the draft minutes. The minutes of our last meeting held on the 18th of March are on page five of the pack. Are members content with the minutes of the 18th of March as drafted? Yes. Agreed. All agreed? agreed. Thank agreed. you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move on then to agenda item three, which is matters arising. Members have been provided with a copy of the fifth report of the examiner of statutory rules of page eight of your meeting pack. Mm -hmm. The examiner draws attention to the draft discretionary support amendment COVID-19 regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and states that the wording of the amendment in regulation two of the draft regulations may be clarified with the addition of words such as a member of before the immediate family. You understand that. The examiner has advised the department that she is content that a correct correction slip may be used to make the appropriate addition on this occasion. The addition, although minor, will add to the clarity of the provision. Can I ask again, are members content to note this? Agreed. Okay, thank you. We'll move on then to item agenda number four, which is chairperson's business. Um, I want to make members aware that I spoke to the minister about a range of issues on a telephone call last week. The minister has provided a brief note on those issues, which you'll find at page 17 of your papers. You'll note that the minister has agreed to provide further information on those issues. Firstly, before I ask members comments, can I ask our members content to note the minister's paper? Agreed. Agreed, members? Agreed. Okay. And then I want to ask um, then if members want to make any comment on that. Um, first, I'm going to work this. We'll, we'll all get a chance to come in first, whether it's in the room or via teleconferencing. So for this part, I'm going to go to those on the phones first and ask if they any comment in relation to that paper um, between the conversation that the Minister and myself. So, Mark, I'm going to go to you first. Have you any comment or do you content to go on? Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just to suppose in terms of the, the last item, they're all very uh, pertinent points that these were, were, were discussing. But it's, it's given, I suppose, the reason for Mr. joining us today, and that's around the, 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 the bill dealing with tenancies in the private rental sector. I was wondering about the conversation that you've had around uh, students. Yeah. For rent and accommodation, and I wonder if maybe yourself or the minister with the principals chatting could maybe give us some more detail on how that conversation went or what can and is going to be done how to help students in that situation and the landlords as well. Okay, thank you, Mark. I know the minister is with us and she's listening in. Um, whenever we um, get around to our questioning with the minister later, um, if she can take a note of that as well, then we'll get back. Or we, we'll ask her that then. Um, thanks, Mark. Can I move on then to Carol? Um, yes. Well, first of all, I welcome all the announcements that the ministers brought forward, and particularly, you know, the, the collective effort with the executives to try and reach the, those who are most vulnerable. So I think, uh, you know, I mean, we're in an extraordinary time, so I think that stuff is very welcome. And like Mark, I have some concerns around the table paper on the, or the draft bill in the private member, the private rented sector, um, because we all have received a lot of uh, correspondence yeah. from students and indeed from their families. And while the landlords are going to receive a mortgage holiday, they're, they're passing that on from the admin to that being the student who are not able to work, who are in really extreme poverty. And I'd be really concerned that this is a group that 
while I looked at the bill, I didn't see the need to have a specific mention. Um, however, I do think we need to have a specific conversation about landlords and students, particularly the pressure that's been applied either by landlords directly or through their letting agents. Okay, thank you, Carol. We'll ask that to, uh, also then at that dear list. Um, I'm going to come to you, Fran, next. Have you any comments on the conversation on the on t on the paper at page 17 of the meeting pack? No, I think that uh, Ali and Mark has uh, made, made the point about students and about the private rental sector. Okay. Uh, I do think it, it highlights again the, the, the urgent need uh, for us to, when uh, things get back to normal, to deal with uh, the, 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 the whole uh, difficulties there are around the private rental sector. But uh, what Mark and uh, Carl have said it reflects my attitude. Okay, thank you. Fra Sinead, any comments? Um, yeah, like Fab, Carol, and Mark have covered it. Um, I just wanted to put my thanks to the minister for, for the recent announcement, particularly around um, the discretionary support um, measures and as well the announcements that she's um, she's made in regards to the, the support sector and to the arts and culture sector as well to be very warmly received. But the student renters issue is a burning issue, and I know every MLA will, will, will have been getting lobbied heavily on it. So. I'll await um, the Minister's response later on, and we can have a more detailed conversation about that. Okay, thank you, Sinead. And then, finally, Robin? Uh, no, I'm content with what's been raised. Uh, uh, the first two items, really, just, I suppose, in the benefit cap item, we're asking people to go the extra mile in uh, contributing extra hours. In this crisis, we want to make sure that, that uh, when they respond to that, that indeed that they don't end up being penalised because of it. No. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Okay, I'm going to move then into the room. Any members in the room want to make a comment, Johnny? Uh, yep. Thanks, Chair. I would like to thank the Minister for the work of the Department thus far in these challenging times. It seems to be that the Department of Communities has certainly uh, lifted its game to address the concerns that we're all facing. Uh, I would share members' concerns in relation to the students uh, and the knock-on effect in terms of rent. I myself have been lobbied by a lot of students on this issue, and I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say. And on the second point, the Sports COVID-19 Relief Fund, uh, I'm glad the Department has realised the significant pressure uh, financially facing many of our sporting uh, organisations across the country, and indeed the great uh, community uh, service that they provide at this time, and I look forward to the Minister giving us an update further whenever she has her contribution. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Kelly? Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to the Chair and to the Minister for having that conversation. A lot of the areas there are areas that I actually wanted to ask the Minister about, but in particular the universal credit. Um, Having spoke to a number of the advice organisations, it, it does appear to be that the internal processes um, within that universal credit system, as is highlighted in your conversation, um, are creating the need for phone calls to happen, um, and then those phone calls aren't happening. For instance, asking people um, to have an interview, and then the interview being cancelled at short notice. So, um, I'd be interested to hear from the minister what's happening internally to ensure that that system is as streamlined as possible, because our staff are. Um, heavily inundated with calls at this time and to create unnecessary calls really is just tying up the system. Okay, thank you. Kelly, Andy, did you want to make any comment there? No. Are you happy enough? Content. Um, all the, the issues have been echoed. Just uh, I echo Kelly's comments around the universal credit getting a lot of constituents highlighting difficulties with online verify and also then um, telephone callbacks not being met on time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, so that then there's there's a few questions there for for the minister later on. Um, I'm going to then move on to uh, chairperson's business. No, I think it says chairperson's business. And more on that. Um, I want to inform members that I also spoke with Robert Murda of the National Union of Students this week on the impact of COVID-19 on student renters and students who have lost their jobs as a result of the crisis. The committee has also been contacted on this subject, and the email is at page uh, 435 of your pack. Um, Robert very much in that conversation reiterated um, what has already been said here this morning. I will not go over it again. and I know that was part of the conversation then that I had had with the Minister. Um, so uh, Maybe then later on um, in, in our conversation with the Minister, we will get some answers to that. I will move on then to item, or the next 
uh, part of Chairperson's business, I also want to inform members that I was contacted by uh, Camera, who are concerned that if changes are not made to allow small breweries to sell their products online, many of those small breweries are going to go under. Um, so again, that's something that um, maybe the Minister can um, answer today to look at that about changing legislation, or if not, we can certainly put it in writing um, after today's uh, meeting. Um, I know that unlike the rest of the United Kingdom, um, small breweries in other parts of the UK are able to, to sell online, whereas here they can't. They have to go through the likes of various sort of craft beer clubs and things like that. Which is um, not they're not selling then to the or they're, they're receiving uh, a much lower price for their product. So um, that's something that maybe could be looked at um, going forward as well. So I'll then move on. Members, I have nothing else in chair, under chairperson's business. Um, um, are members content that we approach in that way then going forward during this meeting? Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. Moving on then to agenda, agenda item number five, which is private tenancies coronavirus modifications bill. Members, can I draw your attention to the tabled items where you will find the bill as well as the explanatory and financial memorandum? Um, <coughs> excuse me. The examiner has advised the department that she is content that the correction slip may be used to make the appropriate addition. On, sorry, I'm not reading the right paper here. I've got confused. What am I on? Page six. Sorry, folks. There we are. Sorry. Bear with me, members. I'll start again there. Um, and agenda item five: private tenancy. Or sorry, yes, private tenancies. Coronavirus modifications bill. Members, can I draw your attention to the tabled items uh, where you'll find the bill as well as the exam, explanatory and financial memorandum. Members should note that the bill has been renamed. It was previously titled the Private Tenancies Emergency Modifications Bill 2020. Um, if members have any questions, can you please wait until the Minister has briefed us and I will come to you. Um, mm -hmm. I'll then proceed as follows and thank you very much, Minister, um, for joining us today. We very much appreciate um, your attendance here at committee. Um, can I also welcome David Polly, senior official from the department, who has also dialed in to assist the committee today. And uh, you're both very welcome. And can I ask, Minister, would you uh, care to brief us? Sure. Just before we oh, go on, sorry. quickly, can yeah. I declare? Sorry, apologies, Minister. Just wait. Can I declare an interest as a private rented landlord? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Any other members have to declare an interest at this stage? No. no. Okay. Thank you. No. Sorry, Minister. No. If you could please proceed. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And obviously, I'm joined, as you said, um, Chair by David and Charlie also Eilish from the department. So then we have to the conference. come in anything at the end. So just again, thanks to the committee this morning, just to allow me the opportunity to address you around the introduction of the tenancies, um, private tenancies, coronavirus modification bill 2020. And I suppose essentially what we're trying to do here is to extend the notice to quit period from four weeks up until 12 weeks before the date in which um, it can take effect during the unprecedented public health emergency. And as you will all be aware, mortgage lenders have provided by the let landlords and also homeowners the ability to apply for a three month uh, holiday on their repayments. And obviously oh. this bill intends to ensure the tenants in the private joined sector the conference. are also provided with some protections in this crisis as well. Um, it will also uh, reduce the movement of people between households, and I think that's the important point. There's obviously 40,000 letters have been distributed by local GPs telling people that they must shield for the next three months, and obviously there are people in self-isolation and distancing, so now wouldn't be the time for a big movement of people um, from home. So obviously that's why we want to extend this period as well. So. I'm really here today to ask uh, the committee to agree to accelerate a passage for this bill because this crisis obviously was oh, interesting God. in the extent that it was going to be and obviously um, things have moved really quickly and we're trying to respond uh, to those changes as quickly as we can. The bill obviously um, is required as soon as possible in order that many um, I suppose to, for benefits for those who are living in the private rented sector or to give some certainty um, that they won't be evicted from their properties. And obviously there's 18% of our overall population within the private rented sector and 134,000 properties. So it is a large amount of people. 
and particularly families with children as well. Without the accelerated passage, uh, there is a risk that the bill wouldn't be enacted before the summer recess. And obviously that would go well beyond the 12 week period that we're asking people uh, to shield and also to distance. Um, so therefore, again, I just want to thank members. Um, David and Ailish, as I said, can come in on any specifics, but I do want to take the opportunity to thank members to allow me to present this this morning and just ask that we can present this bill in the coming weeks via the accelerated passage uh, process. Okay, thank you, Minister. And just before um, I start, can I just advise members um, that given the nature of our meeting today, I'd like to, to avoid any duplication in questioning, questioning as much as possible. Um, so at the risk of sounding rude, um, if you indicate that you wish to ask a question, but your question is asked before I get to you, please do not feel the need to ask it again. Um, I'll not be accepting a long list of questions from single members. I'll go around members again if necessary. And I want members to be disciplined in their questioning. And with the greatest respect to members, I'd also like everyone to try to avoid the temptation to make some speeches today. And can we all please try to stick to the point we wish to make and ask the questions we wish to ask? Also, can I ask all members to refrain from interjecting um, when other members are speaking? Um, it's uh, particularly diff difficult, especially for our, our Hansard folks, um, to keep a note if we do that. And also, I just want to finally say I'm not going to take any supplementary questions or interventions during this either. Um, it just would all become just a little bit messy if that happened. If you do have a supplementary question, I'm more than happy. I'll come back to everyone, especially those on teleconferencing, um, as we go along. And this part of the meeting is really to discuss this bill and nothing else. The the minister I know um, ha, well has a little bit of time, and I'm sure she'd be more than happy to take some questions on other issues after we've discussed this. So if, if, if members could hold off on all of those other questions they might want to ask the minister, and um, and I, I, again I say I know that the, the minister. Um, has, is time bound as well, but she's given us a little bit of time today to go over and above on some of the questions. So, if members, if that's all clear to you, can I just start by thanking the minister and and, and thanking her for for being able to come in and join us here today. Um, the very first clause refers to the emergency period, which is the period during which the provisions of of the bill apply. This period begins on the day after this bill receives royal assent, and that perhaps could be the end of April. Yet clearly, by the time um, the, the current crisis will have been will will have been going on for a couple of months. Um, clause five prevents a retrospective approach. Um, can I ask why you've taken that approach when there are likely to be? people possibly under the threat of eviction now or within the next couple of weeks? Minister? Yeah, well, we know, and I'm going to get David to come up. Sorry. Go ahead. Was there somebody looking in there? No. No, will you go ahead. Sorry, Minister, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, well, it's just I'm going to get David to come in here as well, because obviously we have looked at this. I obviously wanted to give as much protection around this as possible, but obviously in terms of trying to back the to the bill, um, that that wouldn't be possible, um, that we have been advised in terms of legalities around it, that it would have to be from the date when royal assent um, is passed. Okay. And obviously that's why we're trying to take the accelerated passage to try and reduce the risk as much as we can. Um, I'm going to ask David to come in, because obviously he's been engaging with DSO around this over the last couple of weeks. Okay, thank you, yeah, David. Um, Hi everyone. Um, yes, that's, that's essentially the point. Is is that taking retrospective provisions is extremely complex in, in terms of, for example, human human rights implications for going backwards and saying that people who entered into contracts under one set of expectations of what their legal position is, do then go back and tell them that um, it isn't. So it's our, our legal advice is that that just isn't possible. Um, I, I would want to make another point, which is that. Um, Courts are currently only taking emergency or urgent issues, and they have confirmed with us that evictions or repossessions um, would not be deemed as urgent issues. So at the at the minute, um, people shouldn't be being told by a court that they have to leave the house because the court will just routinely adjourn that at the minute. Um, and then just in, in summary, I suppose when we get to the end of all this and we do lessons learned, Yes, there is a lesson here. I mean, we need to move quickly. It turns out that quickly is four or five weeks. 
um, maybe in the, the assembly we need to, if this was to happen again in the future, there would be a way that we can do something like this more quickly. Um, because you're entirely right, the time this comes into place, it will be going on for six to eight weeks. Okay, thank you, David, and thank you, Minister, for clearing that up. And can I just ask another question? Um, the, the bill doesn't refer um, to rental payments which tenants may accrue during the emergency period. Is it the case that after this period is over, tenants will be expected to pay these rental arrears? Yeah, well, what this bill is about, I mean, obviously the housing piece overall will come in different sections. So not everything will be answered in this piece of legislation. So obviously what this is about is about the notice to quit period, and we want to extend that out. Now, that will mean that there may be incurred debt beyond that, and obviously we're trying to look at other measures that we can do um, to look at that in the time ahead. As I say, landlords have been given a three-month uh, holiday period if they apply for it through um, their, their lenders, and obviously we're saying the landlords that that should be passed on uh, to the tenants as well. That's why we've also looked at discretionary support payments, crisis payments to help uh, cover and cost. And we're also looking to see if we can introduce further measures around the discretionary housing payments. And um, we're, we're looking at those uh, currently. Okay, thank you, Minister. And just following on from that, um, just about the you know how people apply for this, um, it's very much um, a clear link between the the three month um, holiday, the mortgage holiday, um, that is already there. Um, um, if if that three months holiday uh, mortgage payment isn't extended, what will be the impact on the potential extension of the twelve week? Um, protection period that you're that you're you're talking about today and then also um will a private tenant have to provide evidence that they have lost their job in order to have these uh, provisions apply because that is certainly what is happening for people to get a mortgage holiday they have to provide a certain amount of evidence to their banks or building societies in order to get that and then just a, a third question on that will be to do with those that are maybe on furlough and receiving 80% of their salary, um, are we then expecting those people to be paying 80% of their rent? Um, uh, uh, you know, in, in for, for total fairness, I suppose, across the board. Yeah, well, I suppose um, within this, it's an initial 12-week period, and obviously, I will be assessing that period um, over those 12 weeks to look to see if the public health situation um, is still. I suppose, where it is today, um, and I will have the ability to extend that period um, beyond that in terms of trying to offer fuller protection. I suppose what we're encouraging tenants and landlords to do is to engage with each other. Yeah. I don't have the power to bring in a certain piece of legislation that stops payments altogether, um, and so therefore trying to extend the notice to quit period to try to ensure that there's no eviction. Um, is one power that I do have, and that's why we're bringing this forward uh, this morning. We are going to be issuing guidance, hopefully towards the end of this week, to landlords in terms of what they should be doing to protect tenants, because obviously if an eviction did happen, they wouldn't have another tenant to move into the property, because obviously there's advice from government that there should be no movement, that people should be limiting contact, um, that there should be shielding for certain sec sections of our community. Um, to stay indoors for the next three months. So we have initially applied the 12 weeks for that shielding period, but I will be keeping this under constant review. And if the situation is still the same today in 12 weeks' time, then I do have the ability to extend that period out. Okay. I don't know if David wants to come in or Elish on any of that as well. Um, can, I, well can I just add that, um, I mean, yeah, the, minute, the minister's made the, the basic point. The point here is what we want is for tenants and landlords to come to reasonable agreements um, once everything which has changed so rapidly in the last few weeks that was down. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that we've passed a, a rent day and that a lot of people will now be in arrears. But as you've pointed out, a lot of them will have applied for UC and will be getting that money or they will have applied for the furlough scheme or the self-employed scheme and they will be getting that money. And it's just a case really of letting things um, sit for a bit um, while those things come through and making sure that nobody is evicted in the meantime, um, we are going to be publishing guidance um, this week and that guidance will just set out our expectation that uh, 
landlords and tenants will come to reasonable agreements over this, um, that there's a range of measures in place to support the incomes of tenants and, the, and, to, support, and to help landlords, you know, loan schemes as well as the mortgage holiday for the buy to let landlords. And that all taken together, those create space that everyone can come to a reasonable agreement. And we're also working with the court service in and around this as well to make sure that we're all joined up. And um, there's a few of the, I mean, a few of the other things that we haven't mentioned. Um, LHA is going back to the 30th percentile for everybody, so that's going to help people. That's basically giving more money through housing benefit and, uni- and universal credit to renters to help them. And we've also um, agreed with the housing executive that the discretionary housing payment will pay. Um, there's a few exceptions, but for people who lose their jobs and come on to um, UC that it'll pay their full rent for 13 weeks, which is the position that used to be under housing benefit. Um, so they, they won't have to like drop straight back down the LHA and lose out money and lose that money in the meantime. So there's a range of measures to support the income um, of both tenants and to support the business of the landlords. And because of that, um, we'll be making clear in our guidance that we expect everyone to wait until this period's over and then come to a reasonable agreement as to when arrears, if there are any remaining, will be paid. And I suppose uh, out of all of this Sorry. as well, I mean, there shouldn't be anyone there that's facing eviction, really, because there is a there's a large safety net in place, whether that is a, or, a, is through uh, the benefit system or, or through conversations that landlords and tenants should be having with one another at an early stage. Sure. Could I come in and feel Shoni here? Um, yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, I just wouldn't want anyone to think that um, we haven't been issuing any guidance up until this point. Through the tenant deposit scheme and the three companies who administer the tenant deposit scheme, we had written out directly to all of the tenants who have a, a protected deposit, and that was over 60,000 households, and referred them to where help and support is available while the bill, the detail around the bill was being worked up and referred them to housing rights for some support so that if anyone had been given a notice to quit or was facing eviction, then you were to go and they could get some further guidance around courts and what was happening at the moment. Okay, thank you, Elish, for, for that. I'm going to then go to the members in the room first and foremost. Um, Kelly? Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, I believe that this is a very welcome piece of legislation, but I just wanted to get some clarifications, and I appreciate I won't be asking a lot of questions. Um, some tenants are finding now that they can circumvent this legislation already because of fixed term contracts where landlords are stating that, for instance, with students, that because the fixed term contract is coming to an end that they must pay their outstanding debt. And can I just ask what consideration has been taken to those tenants with regards to their credit rating? Because a landlord, th- this legislation doesn't prevent a landlord from reporting someone um, for breach of, of a contract. Well, I know I'm going to get uh, David to come in here because I know he's been engaging with the uh, Students' Union um, in terms of picking up on some of these issues and obviously the hardship that many of them are facing. But we know through our engagement with the court service, for example, that there won't be evictions or they won't be listing eviction hearings um, at this time. Um, And that's obviously something that we want to push further on and that's why we're bringing the legislation in and obviously we are issuing as we say as a guidance this week um, to landlords and how they should be approaching this situation because we are in a public health emergency they have a responsibility to protect people as well but I'll ask David in terms of that engagement um, and correspondence that we have made particularly around students David if you want to give a bit of an update on the letter that was issued Yeah we um well, Chair, you referred to the safety net, and there's a comprehensive set of, of things in place. There is one group, and a lot of the members have picked this up earlier, I heard, on the Chair's business, that um, students who are in full-time education are generally not eligible yep. for universal credit. Yep. Um, they're also quite often will be in jobs which might not fall under the furlough scheme. Mm. Um, so there is a, potentially a group of people that the member has identified here who might not be protected. Um, so we've been engaging with, with as, as many of you will have, we have been approached by a lot of students and the representative organisation. And while we've, we've set out everything that we're doing, um, we are also engaging with the Department for Economy to see if we can do anything through the student hardship funds, which would be an obvious way of helping this group of people. Um, um, further, just further to that, I suppose, um, I haven't... 
I haven't taken forward any thoughts about credit rating and how this might affect the credit rating, but I suppose the point of this legislation in, in and amongst all the other things which are going on in the private rented sector, and there's so many different initiatives and things happening, and it's all happening at, at pace, that this is something which is needed to create that breathing space for everyone to work out what's going on. And this is just one bit of a much, much bigger picture. Um, so I'd ask you all to take the bear that in mind, because I know that you are all going to aware of those broader things, but this we need this legislation through quickly just to provide that breathing space to let us work all of those things out to make sure that in the meantime, nobody has to leave the home. Okay, okay. Anybody else in the room? Johnny? Just a quick question. It was mentioned earlier in relation to the communication with landlords uh, and what has been done to date. When do the landlords expect to receive the next piece of correspondence from the department in relation to this? We are in the middle, um, David and Ailish and their team are in the middle of just finalising the guidance for landlords um, and we're hopeful that that will be issued later this week. Okay. Um, we can communicate that with the committee um, while we're issuing it to the landlords themselves. I would appreciate that, thanks Minister, because I think it's important. Yeah, no, no problem. Communications key here for many landlords who are also um, looking at guidance from the department as to what the next steps may be. Okay, Andy? Yeah, just very quickly, Chair. Um, we, we've mentioned throughout our conversation here of various different avenues available to private rented tenants that they can avail of to help pay their rent, discretionary housing payment, etc. Is the department going to publish any guidance that can be put in simple format um, to the general public? There is already a lot of information out there, Minister. Um, simple guidance that can be conveyed to individuals that may be being impacted by this, of their options that are available to them. Yeah, no, we can do that. I mean, I suppose we're, there's a, so much information going out, it's confusing people um, and even trying to find where to get it. So obviously there's the NI direct line and then you can click in in terms of the housing piece. But I'll take that away and look at it. We're obviously also engaging and looking at an increased resource for housing rights service um, because obviously now they're continuing to get a lot more queries around this in terms of um, security of tenure um, within the private rented sector particularly. So we'll take that away to see if we can do something more simplified um, in a leaflet that can be put online and also issued to people, and then I'll come back to the committee just with a response. <coughs> Just one follow-up, Minister. Minister, obviously, we're, this is welcome that we're, we're moving to protect those in the private rented sector in terms of evictions. Um, at the other end of this, where we're outside of the crisis, and indeed, private se sector landlords have a part to play in respect of safeguarding and protecting tenants. Um, is there a piece of work to be done mm -hmm. at the other side of this um, to ensure that we don't end up with an increased level of homelessness mm -hmm. as a result of situations whereby tenants haven't been able to afford to pay their rent and landlords then move at the other side of this legislation to evict tenants? Yeah, I think it's a fair point, um, Andy, and that's, I mean, obviously the ultimate aim of all the actions is to keep people in their home. Um, to ensure that they have that roof over their head and that they're not forced or feel that they have to leave their property either during this um, public health emergency or after. As David touched on there, obviously there's pieces of legislation and work that we need to do urgently to respond to the urgent needs. Once we start to move this through, we're obviously looking at discretionary support in terms of the income threshold, for example, as well, to allow more people to receive immediate support. Once we do all of that, then we will move to a situation to look at the longer term. If we come out of this period, um, what are the further protections that we can build in? What's the further guidance that we can be given? Obviously, this will be in line with the uh, public health announcements. There could be a potential second wave of this virus, and indeed, what will the impact of that be um, on those tenants? But ultimately, our aim, uh, my aim, is to keep people in their properties, um, to ensure that there is no eviction, to ensure that nobody does feel that they're homeless and to try and work with people around if they do have a reduction um, in their finance to try and navigate either through the social security system or are there new other measures that we can be putting in. So I'll be continuing to look at this. Um, if there's any, I suppose, information that members want to give or any suggestions, I'm more than happy um, to receive that as well. And David and Ailish will be working on this and they have been over the last couple of weeks and will continue. Once we get this legislation through, we'll then be looking at those next uh, steps and what more we can be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I just make 
yeah, that, that's entirely right. That's, I mean, we have to make sure this lands well at the end of it. Um, we've already written this week to the court service um, to see if there's anything we can do in the space of when we say, um, you know, we're saying that landlords and tenants should work through this and get to the end of the end of um, the period and then come to a reasonable agreement. Um, what we need to do really is, if at that point, um, ideally, the position would be that any landlord knows that they have to do, you know, what reasonable looks like. That it is over a period of time that they can't just at that point just go straight for eviction and the court will let them do that. You know, we want to work with the court service around defining and making sure that reason that reasonable discussion and that those opportunities to work everything out and let everything settle down and get back to how they were take place. Um, rather than as you say, landlords just getting to the end of all this and going, right, well you're all you're all in the rear, so that's it, you're all out. Um, that that wouldn't so we're ready. We've already started um, that discussion with court service, and um, I, I would be happy once we know where that's going to update the committee. Sure. And David, sorry, it's Ailish it's, here. Sorry, Chair, if I could just say that we, we have already heard examples of, of many of the good landlords there are who are working with their tenants to come up to to come up with um, arrangements and putting arrangements in place um, where rent can be reduced and rent can be paid. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move now to uh, those that have dialed in. So I'm going to take it in this order. I'm going to go with Carol, Frash, Sinead, Robin, and then Mark. So, Carol. Okay. Um, so, hello, David, Elise, and Deirdre, um, and everybody okay. else that matter. So, David, um, you've already outlined that students normally aren't eligible for universal credit, and even the discretionary port support is really the, the bridge. For the the social landlord and the tenant, I I would appeal that um, Deirdre, if you can, to get the executive, particularly through the minister for the economy, to look specifically at a hardship fund in the way that you have done around mitigating the worst impacts of the most vulnerable, because students are falling between the nets. Um, uh, Elise rightly says that there are some great discussions with some good landlords, but to be honest with you, we don't hear about those often. We hear about the ones, the landlords, and maybe through their letting agents that are basically a plan and on to pressure. So if we could look at um, a specific uh, hardship fund coming from the Department of the Economy, um, I think that would be good news for the executive. I just feel that there's particularly around, and right, rightly so, around landlords, it has fallen as a department for the community, but this is something that, in my opinion, the department for the community needs to step up. The other aspect of it is that I wanted to query was that David's answered it. It's really just in terms of the Lord Chief Justice's guidance on what is an emergency matter for the court. And if this, this is if this goes through accelerated policy, which I'm arguing that it should, um, that th you, you will have the power to extend that. I think you might need an extension to give people grace um, in order to try and get their own personal circumstances in order, either based as tenants or as landlords. And then the last point I'll make is this, is that um, a lot of students' parents have been furloughed or are now on universal credit and they can't help out. And I definitely think that that is a big factor that needs to be fed in. And even the shade impact, if any hardship fund that does come from the Department for the Community, the dear dear, if you could look at shade impact for some of the students, because I have spoken to some of them, and I know the community of how to deliver them essential items like bread and milk and pastas and rice, because they literally are on their uppers. And it's not like they're sitting with, as the perception is, a massive carry of the beer weighing, et cetera, at their back. They literally haven't got money to eat, a lot of them. And this is, this is the, the sort of hardship that none of us want to fall between the, the net. So thank you. Yeah, no, I suppose thanks for those um, points. And obviously they're all crucial. Um, and I think the first thing on the discretionary support um, because this is now declared a disaster by myself in terms of the COVID-19 um, scenario that we're in, the changes in the amendments that I brought forward under discretionary support a couple of weeks ago in the chamber would allow students um, to avail of that crisis discretionary support as long as they fall within the income threshold. 
and obviously um, trying to change and increase that income threshold as well. And as long as they are, if they're self-isolating as a result of showing symptoms of the coronavirus or have been diagnosed and they have to then stay at home, they can apply for that crisis loan, um, sorry, crisis grant for discretionary support. So that is open to students also, and that's a flexibility that we've looked at. And obviously we're trying to look at others. Primarily, as we've touched on, it would be initially through the Student Hardship Fund. Um, and I am engaged, and I know my officials are engaging with the Department of Economy and Education in terms of further education colleges. So we would want that fund to be increased. Obviously, there are people who avail of that fund at the moment, but there are more people who have fallen into hardship as a result of uh, this emergency. So we are asking and looking for that hardship fund to be increased, and we'll continue. I'll continue to work with those ministers around seeing if we can do that. The issue of the food parcels, um, there's no problem. I mean, I'll be getting my officials to be engaging with the National Union of Students um, based here just to see what we can do specifically, that if there are students there, is there a way that we can get that service to them? Uh, the main point of this service, I mean, it's initially targeting 10,400 families or individuals, but we do have the ability to scale that up um, if it's needed. So I'll be getting the officials to engage with the student union just to see if there is anyone um, that doesn't have any support network or finances then, because the last thing we want is someone to go hungry. And if we can provide those food parcels, then I'll pick that up today. Okay, Carol, is that you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Move on to Fra. Sure, thank you very much. And, uh, I think all of us realise that the world has changed within the past number of months. And uh, all the sureties that we had uh, two, three months ago no longer exist. And I would like to thank the Minister uh, for the speedy way that she has moved uh, to try to plug many gaps. That if, not, if it had not been plugged, uh, would have left many people in great, great difficulty. So many thanks, Minister. Also to David and Ewish, uh for the information of today. I think the big... Uh, difficulty we all face in that in the whole issue of information and communication. And I appreciate uh, the, 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 the connection that the department, uh, I think as David said, has, has uh, said and tying in with uh, different organisations. But sometimes uh, a lot of the information gets lost in the translation of the thing. And I think one of the members said that uh, simplification of uh, the message is probably the best way forward. Uh, I would also ask, is there a possibility uh, that the department could pull together uh, a meeting of the likes of uh, Student Union, the line from the landlords, the department, House and Rates, and I, and any other ones who have an interest in it, so that everybody is very clear and very sure of uh, what the, the direction that the minister and the department is going on. Okay, thank you, Prime Minister. Yeah, no Thanks very much for that. And um, I know Andy covered the communication bit as well, so I can pick that up with the department to see if we can put out a, a more simplified and easier to read document that can be online as well, looking at housing, but also the financial support that's available for people that are struggling. So I'll take that away today, and then I can update the committee just in the time ahead around what we can do um, or publish to make sure that it's it's readable for people. Um, the other issue then around, obviously we're issuing this guidance this week to landlords. Um, I know David and Ailish and others have been continuing to engage um, with all of the different stakeholders. So the idea of a beacon for us, that's something I can pick up and have a look at um, once we have this guideline uh, published and then I can update the committee as we're progressing. There's no problem. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Fred. Fred, do you want to come back or are you OK? Yeah, just a, just a, a, one of the issues, and uh, I think all of us have said uh, that whilst there are quite a number of landlords uh, out there uh, who provide good, decent uh, accommodation and work with their tenants, there is a, a rough of landlords uh, that have created major, major difficulties and problems. They allow me, uh, I understand, uh, represent a considerable number of uh, tenants, so I think it's crucial uh, that uh, they're, they're not only are they kept in the loop, uh, but that, that they all understand uh, where everybody stands in this issue of any abuse of, of their talent. Okay, thank you, Fra. Um, move on then to Sinead. 
Hi, yeah, well, listen, Fra and Carol have covered um, most of the, the issues and the, the questions that I had. Um, and I just want to echo what, what Fra had said there in terms of um, the Minister's proactive attitude um, since this crisis has begun. And um, I really think the agreement is led by example on this. But um, I, I would just have a, a, a question, and for, forgive me if this has been explained before I had a... I had a delivery come to the door there, so I had a dip out for, for a few seconds. But um, it's just in terms of clause five when it say, says uh, no res uh, retrospectivity occurs. Just a wee bit of clarity around that, and also I'm just and I know like, we're always looking more and more and more. But um, and the minister, as I said, it has done a sterling work over the last number of weeks in terms of this and, and the, the measures that she's introduced. But um, you know. Dearly, uh, will you be looking to uh, bring forward any, any further measures in terms of dealing with the COVID crisis going forward? Yeah, no, um, again, I know David can come in on part of this, Sinead, but obviously the legal opinion that we're given in terms of retrospective uh, for this legislation, they're saying that that would be extremely difficult. Obviously, we're pushing ahead now just to ensure that the protection does come in. Um, and obviously, just with Easter recess, we don't want to have any on due delay um, because we would hope that this could come in by the end of April um, if possible if everything runs in tandem but it is obviously something that we'll look at in the time ahead. Um, but what was your second question to me? Oh other yeah. measures, sorry. Yeah, we we will be having other announcements um, over the coming weeks. Obviously we're working across the department on a variety of measures as we move and do with one area we're looking to move to other areas as well as the situation unfolds so there will be no more announcements on the coming days and in the coming weeks and i suppose there i had an agreement with paul as the chair that as we issue press releases um we'll notify the committee as we're going along with those perfect thank you thank you sinead uh robin have you any comments you want to make um thank you thank you chair and uh, i think this is uh sorry i should have at the beginning declared an interest as a as a landlord okay. but uh, i think this is a, a fair piece of uh, of legislation and in this uh, public health uh, emergency i believe it is a piece of legislation that it's uh, essential uh, indeed to ensure that tenants in the private rented sector are protected uh, given the advantages that uh, landlords are, are, are potentially going to avail of I think it is a pity, and I know the Minister has already declared it a pity that it is retrospective, um, because I have a number of tenants uh, who are suffering uh, and have been put out by what uh, one of the previous uh, contributors described as the, the bad, bad landlord sector. But maybe, uh, and this might be for David to answer, Minister, maybe uh, is it possible that if a tenant wishes to leave that this legislation might be impeding on the tenants wish to give up the tenancy um, I, could i could i come in on a chicken point yes go ahead, yes, of course. <laughs> sorry it's it's just that under our existing private tenancies order there are required um notice to quit periods that are set out and we do know that where there has been um, an event in it, and a tenant wants to leave the tenancy early, but in many cases the landlords have accommodated that. So I think it's an arrangement that can be come to between the landlord and the tenant. Okay. Yeah, I, I was it doesn't preclude that. that. It doesn't preclude that from happening. No, this this, legis this legislation doesn't change any of the notice to quit for tenants. And if you look at one one, it's a notice to quit given by a landlord. Um, so yep. a tenant will still be able to give the same notice to quit they've always been able to give, or as the other side, if they're in a contract, you know, our, our advice would say that if it's difficult, you should let them leave it, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm content with that, Chair. Okay, thank you, Robin. And then lastly, Mark, have you any comment further to add to that? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not sure much in the opening remarks, I suppose not to uh, commend the Minister for her. Uh, swift response to this crisis and uh, her attempt to get a safety net in play. There is a good safety net there, and, and, and a number of members have referred to that, but there are holes in it, and where there are holes, there's always people who find those holes, fall through them, and usually land with us. 
uh, that's the thing. I mean, uh, one of the holes here is students that uh, they've been well covered. I think at my initial uh, reaction to seeing the bill that was uh, going through or the accelerated passage was being sought for was that there might be an opportunity to do more to close uh, some of those uh, gaps that do exist. However, I, 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 I'm not going to impede uh, the, the, the smooth and swift passage of this uh, important bill. Like uh, I say, students have been well covered in terms of, of them. Uh, the communication is really important here. It, it, it's, I suppose, about students being made aware, maybe through their representative uh, bodies, of their entitlement uh, to the new uh, discretionary payment or, or crisis grant. I, I, I'm not sure that that awareness is out there. I thought initially around access to universal credit and, and the housing benefit element of it uh, to be a, a potential solution to it. Uh, another group, sorry, Minister from Ramblin. No, you're okay. I, I, I fear might have a potential to fall through the need might be migrant uh, workers as well. Uh, in, in terms of, I suppose, previously, uh, uh, as I understand for non EU migrant workers, they're subject sometimes to no recourse to public funds. There's the habitual residence test in for EEA uh, migrant workers. I'm just conscious of the amount of work on the plates of, of the people and the individuals who are working prodigiously to process all these new claims. Uh, that, that, that could just potentially be uh, an area that's must. Yeah, no, thanks very much for that. Um, and I suppose, I mean, we're moving on this specific piece of legislation in terms of extending the notice to quit period. We are looking at other avenues, and obviously the issue of students has come up. Um, David has communicated with the National Union of Students here um, just last week, um, and we'll continue to look at that in the time ahead. And we've touched on we're engaging with the Department of Economy and Education around the Student Hardship Fund. The issue of communication, I mean, I've touched on a couple of times and we'll definitely take that away and look at it um, to see if there's a better way that we can present the information. And as I say, we'll update the committee on that as we're going along. I know the, the um, EEA kind of residents, those who have no recourse to public funds, we've obviously moved on this through the housing executive in terms of homelessness. Um, where we are housing those people now, they will find accommodation despite not having recourse to public funds. Um, we're seeing obviously this um, public health emergency that no one should be disadvantaged in that way. In terms of social security benefits and the system itself, we're continually looking at this. So obviously we have made flexibilities across the system and we're continuing to look at that um, in the time ahead. I'm actually doing a call later this afternoon just with officials around what additional support um, can we build in um, through this period. So again, I'll update the committee as we're moving through that. And also, if there are suggestions, um, you know, come forward to us, even if that's via Paula um, as the chair of the committee. If there are suggestions or queries, um, send them in, and then we'll make sure that we get them responded to. Okay. The minister, and thank you for your efforts so far. And there was one other group that, that, that oh, well, there's more than one group, but the, one other group that was relevant to today's conversation that are at risk of falling through the net, and that's landlords themselves. And there are many different types of landlords, as, as, as has been referred to. You know, some people may do one property, and they're reasonable and responsible and scrupulous, and they know there are stories out, out, out there about others that. that, that I own a lot more property and you're a lot less <laughs> scrupulous at uh, times. But I mean, I, I, I take on board the issue of the, the mortgage holiday that some people can avail of, but you might, uh, I, I don't know, well come across situations where a landlord no longer has a mortgage and uh, the rental income might be the only income that they have coming in. Do you know what I mean? So if, 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 if that dries up even for a month or two, when the, the furlough scheme gets up and running, the self-employed scheme gets up and running, it might potentially be that small group, I, I imagine it's a small enough group of people with no uh, income or, or, or support whatsoever. And then another maybe convoluted unattended consequence that, that I'd be concerned about. So, so this, will, this legislation will stop any eviction happening. Is, is that the case? 
or, or the, the new supplier from any landlord to remove the entertainment. Let me think say, for example, there was a, a block of flats or an apartment block, uh, and you had a tenant in there who was actually having parties every weekend or every night of the week and inviting people to that place of accommodation in complete breach of the social distancing guidelines and what have you. That the landlord would have no recourse to actually get rid of that tenant and this is a problem. Yeah, no, I understand that. And obviously we have initially looked at the 12 weeks because that should be the kind of shielding period um, in terms of that. Although I would have the ability to extend beyond that if we felt that the need was there in 12 weeks time. In terms of those then, I mean, obviously people have been given clear guidance around distancing, around shielding, um, around not mixing with other tenancies. So that would be an issue then for uh, the police and other agencies also um, to look at those cases on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure then that if there are issues um, like that where there's disruption to the other residents, then that we would be looking robustly at that through the new COVID legislation that uh, came in the effect last week. Okay. Mark, is that you finished? I uh, was just on, on that issue, sorry, Minister, Minister Deb, but the landlords who potentially now have no income whatsoever. Yeah. I know. Well, I know. In terms of universal credit, so even with the system, it uses real time information. So if there's no income coming in, I know even a lot within the self employed um, sector are making claims in the interim for universal credit. Um, yeah. They're able to do that because it uses the real time information. Um, and then they can have the discretionary support around that. If there are again, people as well that are in crisis with no income and where they're having to self-isolate. Um, again, if they fall and below the income threshold, they can have the, the discretionary support. They can apply for those crisis payments as well, um, as long as they meet that new COVID-19 uh, criteria. So I would advise them, I mean, if they want to call, um, obviously engage with David and that's within the department. I know they have been speaking to the Landlords Association and others, they can do that or even to go to um, social security system, um, or they can phone the community helpline number um, as well if there are individuals uh, that are within the community that are struggling and they'll be put in the right direction for support and assistance. And that's the same for students and others who find themselves in the private rented sector as well. They can also phone that community uh, COVID helpline. Yeah, on, on that then, um, and Elise, Elise can come in if she wants, but we've, I mean, we've also been written to by the Landlord Association of Northern Ireland, or LAMI, and, and they more or less made that point, you know, 84, 85 percent of landlords only own one or two houses. Some of them are by the left, um, and their investments for the future, and they're going to be able to holiday. Other ones are businesses, and so I suppose they can take advantage of some of the supports for businesses. Other ones are essentially the income of people, and uh, quite a lot of people in this category would be pensioners, and they would basically, their their income from tenants would be, in, instead of, you know, they would have bought the instead of paying into a, into, a, into a pension fund. So we've, we've written back trying to outline uh, when, if, if, when, when we did it, things have changed, things are always changing and new things are always being added, but we did write back trying to set out all the various supports that there are for different people in different positions. Good. But um, I think, as, as a lot of people have, have alluded to, that there's new things happening all the time. And, um, and we are getting to the, the stage where we're beginning to work through it all and seeing how things might fall for different smaller groups of people. Um, so, so I'm here just to say that the, the letter that the reply to Lani hasn't issued yet will be issued within the next couple oh, of days. Just set out everything, just in case somebody in Lani wonders why they haven't received it. And we're hoping that all the measures that, that the minister has mentioned. Um, and in terms of the mitigation and the assistance that's available for tenants will help landlords from falling into that particular um, area where they are suffering financial hardship as, as well. So that's why the mitigations and the discretionary support and universal credit hopefully mm -hmm. will, will help plug the gap for landlords. But you're right, it's very difficult to plan for every single scenario that's going to arise. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ella. Okay, thank you. And I suppose it's just to, again to encourage people um, that are finding themselves in difficulties to have the conversations with their landlords and also to look within that wider safety net as well when it, you know, housing benefit and discretionary uh, support. Um, uh, because we know there are a lot of good landlords out there, 
as well. Um, uh, and I'm glad Mark made that point as well, because we also know that there are a lot of bad tenants too, um, who do yeah, take advantage, absolutely. and we don't want anybody to be taken advantage of, whether that is the tenant or the landlord. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So those conversations need to keep, take place sooner rather than later. Uh, Minister, can I just ask you, are you available for a little bit of time yet to ask a few questions unrelated to this? Just briefly, because I have an executive meeting at 12, I and I have a pre-meeting of a department call and then a pre-meeting, so I have about <laughs> five minutes to go. Okay, okay. well, we'll do a, a quick run. Just before that, can I just ask members, are they content um, for the bill to proceed via accelerated passage? Are all in agreement? Agreed. 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 Okay. Agreed. That's that done first. I'm going to ask members to be really quick. I have got one just very quick question, Minister. Um, the, the recently uh, announced um, free school meals between yourself and the Education Minister. Um, we had an issue last week about um, uh, the fact that some people don't have bank accounts and they're being told that it has to be paid through a bank account. Is there any update on that and whether they can be paid by cheque? That's my very quick question. There's nothing at the moment. I know the Education Authority are trying to move through this. I know there's 95% of people's bank account details, so they're trying to look at an alternative system. So we'll come back and just update the committee once that's been confirmed. OK, thank you. And I'm going to move now to Johnny quickly. Thank you. Minister, one of the stark realities of COVID-19 is sad, tragic and untimely deaths, with 63 so far and a surge expected within the next 20 days. As a result, families are facing the agonising task of arranging a funeral, and already in difficult circumstances, and because of the unexpected nature, fuel, or funeral poverty is a real reality at the moment. Um, have you had any discussions with your officials, or indeed the National Association of Funeral Directors, on ways in which you can help to address this very sensitive issue, uh, and if not, will you endeavour to do so? Yeah, well, I know the uh, Minister for Justice, Naomi, has obviously been engaging with funeral directors and others around plans. So initially, DOJ are taking that forward. I did present um, to the executive last week that the funeral support payments, that were increasing those payments from £700 up to £1,000, okay. just to try and offer that additional support to those families on low income and are in the qualifying um, group to receive that. And obviously, we're looking um, at what other wraparound support we can do, even in terms of the application process for those direct payments. Can we make that more seamless? Because obviously, this will be a really traumatic time for families who won't get to say goodbye to their loved ones in the way that they would have before this emergency. So we're continuing to look at what other measures we can bring in. But primarily, I've increased the criminal support payments up to £1,000 from 700 and I'm continuing to engage with uh, the Department of Justice and Naomi, the Minister, there um, on those issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move to our, our uh, teleconferencing people. I'm going to take Sinead, Robin, Mark, Carl, and then Fra. So, Sinead, have you any questions? No, listen, I'm not going to detain the Minister. I'll, I'll, I have no questions at this time. Brilliant. Thank you, Robin. No, I'm content. Thank you, Robin. Mark? Mark, are you there? And we'll move on, Carol. No, just to say well done, and if um, the minister and our officials could just push that stuff up about the hardship fund for students with a part for our economy, but um, well done. Okay, thank you, Carol. Fra, have you any more questions for the minister? Uh, just, just, just uh, one comment, and again, uh, in relation to the excellent starting work being done by communities out there. Uh, to make life that little bit easier for people who are suffering uh, through this crisis. Thank you, Fra. Kelly, do you want to say something? Just very quickly, Minister, um, I've had a number of conversations with councils where they've had money from the Department of Communities um, for events that are not now happening during this period because of the pandemic. Um, they're saying that they can't reallocate that money um, for planning ahead to when this crisis may be over in the future to help with businesses and communities come back again. Um, I was just wondering if there's been any discussions between yourselves and those councils to enable them to use that money um, to, to take forward events in a different way so we can build society. Well, I know I've made a couple of relaxations around grants now, primarily these are within the community and voluntary sector and also within our arms like body. Um, where we're trying to relax um, in terms of the finances and also for those organisations that are reorientating themselves to deal with the crisis. 
um, we've relaxed some of that and obviously we're not asking for the same uh, I suppose targets to be met because we know that they're not going to be met in this period so that's where our immediate focus is in terms of finances and resources and trying to realign budgets to deal with the crisis but obviously we are looking at beyond the crisis what support's going to be needed for councils for the local community and voluntary sector as well and I know NICFA has done a lot of research and work um, around sustainability beyond this period. So um, it's something, I mean, it hasn't come to my attention yet in terms of the specifics that you're naming there, Kelly, but I'm more than happy. I mean, we're tied in with Solus on a regular basis. Um, we'll be announcing new measures of working with local councils um, in the coming days here as well through a community support fund. So the issue of future events, um, we can look at it in the time ahead. I suppose once we move out of this emergency period as well so i would just uh, encourage your council if it's your local council to get in contact with the department um, and we'll have a look at this um, as we're coming through the next weeks and months thank you minister thank you okay minister Sorry, Chair. yes mark paula. go ahead Hi, paula when you came to me i had mute on the phone it's, it's mark here oh, go uh, ahead mark just again to thank uh the, the Minister for her response. Obviously, we know the, the breadth of the remit of the Department and therefore the response has had to be on, and there had to be so many different uh, responses on different levels, and I think that, that that's going very well. Uh, obviously, we are working all together to, to close the whole situation in, 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 in the safety net. In terms of the community response, I think that the Minister had announced money going out to the community, I think it was three councils, uh, for the response. Is that separate from the more recent announcement then about the, the food parcels thing? And if so, what takes and balances are there well, the, the money that's going out to, to group to do this much needed work and, and most groups will be bringing into doing it, but to ensure that it is getting to where it needs to be? Yeah, well I think the first thing is I uh, put in um, 200,000 to CFNI Community COVID Response Fund. So we doubled uh -huh. that and that made a £400,000 pot. So it's £1,000 grants for local communities to respond to that need. We obviously then are, are doing the food parcels and we're obviously working with local government in setting up distribution hubs in each of the council areas around the distribution of that service. And we can increase or grow that service if the demand um, is there to do it. The other area then what we're looking to do is to create, I'm looking to bring forward, and again, I'll be announcing that um, later this week, is um, in terms of a community support fund. And this will go through the 11 councils. I'm using the existing community support programme. So my department already gives funding um, and matches that with local councils around community development, community events. So we're setting up this specific fund. There will be a criteria that will be given to local councils and that fund will be used for food. So basic essentials to those who don't fall within the, the food box parcel, financial assistance, addressing poverty, um, and also looking at issues of connectivity, particularly for rural communities as well. So we will be liaising with local councils over the coming days in terms of that funding being disseminated um, to the local councils and then for them to use that guidance to work with the local communities because they know their areas better than I do. Um, yeah, they well, have that's community that's... plans, they have response plans. So using the existing guidance and also this guidance and criteria around food supply, um, sorry, around food supply, around security and connectivity and poverty. Um, you know, we'll be working with them in terms of them delivering local plans to meet that local need. So it may differ slightly across the different councils depending on the need, but it will be within those four areas of uh, food, financial need, poverty and connectivity. Uh, thank you, Minister. And, and community groups do indeed know their own areas. And that's what yeah. concerns me a, a wee bit just in this because we'd be talking, I'm thinking in my own constituency, we'd be talking about neighbourhood renewal areas. But obviously, the, the, the impact of, of, of this uh, pandemic goes way beyond that. And it's just about w where the knowledge exists to, to help those in need outside of the immediate uh, scope of the community groups or, or usual scope of the community group groups, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, I think we're working on two folds. So we're doing the, the local community fund, which would be directed back through the local council. So it wouldn't go directly to the community organisations that will be filtered through the councils that have a broader scope. We're also working on a regional basis then across the north with the likes of Volunteer Now, with the, the Red Cross, um, and with NICFA and others in terms of trying to look at a broader remit. The food parcels we're engaging through the Health Trust, um, the Department of Health as well, and obviously we're working with education and the providers there, such as youth service as well. So all of these will start to kind of fit together. Um, neighbourhood renewal areas, um, obviously we, we are giving flexibility to their grants. So organisations say that may have programme costs, we're allowing flexibilities to be built in to allow them to use the programme costs that they, they can't use at the minute because they've shut down. Can they re-divert then to respond to that localised need? So that will be coordinated then obviously between the neighbourhood partnership and local councils as well to ensure that we don't have duplication, but importantly to ensure that we pick up areas or individuals or groups of people that are maybe left out of the loop. Obviously we're touching, you touched on it there around asylum seekers and refugees. We're engaging um, at a strategic level uh, with that, looking at that issue um, and other specifics that we need to be delivering. Even the food parcels, for example, you know, there may be religious restrictions on certain types of food. So how do we make sure that we can respond um, to that need as well? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Minister. Can I just ask for clarification? Um, the Community Support Fund, um, that has or hasn't been rolled out to councils yet, did you say? It hasn't yet. It, it hasn't. went forward to the executive on Friday, okay. so we'll be engaging councils this week for that money to be released. Okay. So like, we can give updates to the committee um, once we have that sorted. No, and I think Mark raised a very good point, that, and I think it's incumbent uh, amongst our, our, our council colleagues as well um, to try to identify those people that uh, you know rarely fall into um, the net. Um, we have many older people and also people, I suppose, in rural areas that are, are, are not in areas of deprivation but are, are, are socially isolated, and uh, they are the people that we want to reach out to as well. So I think good local knowledge will be essential um, in going forward and helping those people. Um, Minister, can I just, um, just say a massive thank you as well, not only for being here today and coming and briefing us, and also David and Eilish as well, but um, can I just add to what members have said of the work that has been done to date, and can I also thank you for your, your conversations with myself, and I think going forward, um, if members again have any questions, um, I can then speak to you directly. Um, go, uh, uh, hopefully at the end of this week again and then next week and then I'll be able to update members at our next committee meeting if that's okay and then also uh, the outstanding issues that were in our, our paper in our last conversation um, maybe if, if we can get some answers to those um, for our, our next committee meeting as well I'd certainly appreciate that Yeah, no, thanks very much and again just thank the committee in terms of the accelerated passage for the bill um, and again, just I will, Paula, obviously we're going to agree to meet or to touch base every week. Um, and I know there was other queries there today around support and universal credit. So we'll make sure that um, they're answered and they're fed back into you again over the coming days as well. And I suppose I just want to end by thanking, I mean, the staff within the department have been absolutely amazing. They've really responded. Um, they're working day and night, weekends. Um, not just within the department, but across the other government departments and indeed within communities and local councils. So I just want to commend the effort of the staff that's been absolutely brilliant um, in the face of this crisis and because it is a front-facing department, they, many of them are essential services. Um, and so I just want to commend the work um, that they have been doing as well. And again, just thanks to the committee. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, David. Thank you, Elish. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, members, if we then the can move on to Rose agenda begins. item number six, which is Westminster Pension Schemes Bill Legislative Consent Motion. Um, members, the papers for this agenda item are on page 24 of your meeting packs. Um, members will remember that we took a briefing. Department for Communities, Housing. Just bear with us. the conference. 
Yeah, okay, I think that's everybody that needed to leave the conference has left the conference, so I'll, I'll start again there. Agenda item 6, Westminster Pension Schemes Bill, Legislative Consent Motion, as I said, page 24 of your meeting packs. Um, members will remember that we took a briefing from officials on this LCM a number of weeks ago. Members should also note that the Minister has not yet laid the LCM before the Assembly. Once she does, the LCM will be formally referred to this committee. At that point, the committee may, within the 15 working days from the date of referral, consider those issues in the bill which are devolved and report them to the Assembly. Are members content at this point to note the LCM and ask the clerk to identify any potential witnesses who could give evidence on the bill going forward? Are members agreed with that? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Move on then to agenda oh. item number seven, which is SL1, the Discretionary Support Amendment COVID-19 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Members, this SL1 relates to a statutory rule, agenda item eight, which was affirmed by a resolution of the Assembly on the 24th of March. Are members therefore content to note this SL1? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Members agreed. agreed. Okay, then um, move on then to agenda eight, item eight, SR 2020-44, the Discretionary Support Amendment COVID-19 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. As I said, members, this statutory rule was affirmed by a resolution of the Assembly last week. Are members therefore content to note this statutory rule? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Um, then we move on to agenda eight. Item 9, SL1, the Discretionary Support Amendment Number 2, COVID-19 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Members, we have another set of regulations which seem fairly straightforward, but we thought it would be prudent to have officials brief us um, here today. Um, with that, then, can I welcome Anne McCleary and David Tatar to the meeting? Hello. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Chair. Thank you. And if you just give me one moment, I want to just, um, members asked before, we'll give Anne and David an opportunity to brief us. I will then ask a, a question and then we will open it up to members. Um, as I start at first with, well, I don't know who I started with then the last time. We'll just, I'll just decide as we go along who I'll go to bring in. We'll take it sure, from there. Um, and as with previous requests, I'd ask members to keep their questions focused and their comments short. And can I ask Anne and David to begin their briefing, please? Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much, Chair. Um, as members will be aware, these regulations are part of an emergency response to the unprecedented situation in which we now find ourselves. Um, however, we're pleased to have this opportunity to come to the committee, albeit by the wonders of technology, rather than in person, to brief you. Minister and officials have moved at great speed to develop this scheme, to bring it into operation at this almost unimaginable time of worry and stress for everybody. Members will also be aware, and you've already heard about it, the Discretionary Support Amendment COVID-19 regs, Northern Ireland 2020, I think we'll just call those the number one regs, which have recently been passed by the Assembly using the urgent written procedure and which opened up discretionary support to a specific COVID-19 category. And that meant that a grant for short-term living expenses to assist claimants affected by COVID-19 where they or any member of their family have been diagnosed with the condition or advised to self-isolate because of it. Just to note that this is a non-repayable grant rather than a loan, and more than one application can be made providing the eligibility criteria is met. So that's the number one set. The discretionary support amendment number two, COVID-19 regs Northern Ireland 2020, will further widen the discretionary support scheme to a greater number of low-income households but it raises the income threshold, in other words, the criteria, to just over £20,000 to bring the scheme in line with the benefit cap. This is another element of support to people who are in financial distress, which is unique to this jurisdiction. We're keenly aware of the ongoing crisis in which people now find themselves through no fault of their own, and this is part of the Minister's and the Department's strategy to target the support to those who are most in need. 
Now, David Tower is also on the line, uh, but he and I are both available for any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, just a couple of questions I want to ask first. Uh, you'd mentioned there um, that the number one discretionary support was in the form of grants. Is that also the same then for the number two, or is it a mixture of loans and grants? Just to clarify that. David yeah. can confirm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, the number two rates will increase the income threshold for the entire discretionary support scheme. Okay. So it's not providing a new grant. It's simply allowing more people potentially to access the scheme. So that could be grants or loans. Importantly, they will be able to access the, the new COVID-19 grants. Uh, so we will anticipate most people, and really the purpose of bringing the income threshold increase in now is to allow more people to access that specific grant. But it does mean that anybody who would be captured by the new income threshold can access loans as well. Okay, so it's a mixture of both then, and that will be just dependent on their circumstances? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, can I then just ask as well, um, the budget for discretionary support um, is £16 million, and the Department recently identified potential increase of expenditure of a further £9.6 million. That was before these proposed regulations. Um, do you think that um, £25.6 million then um, at least will initially cover the cost of implementing this, or do you see that going up somewhat? Uh, I think it's probably a fairly safe assumption that it, it could go up. I mean, the 9.6 million we've estimated um, for COVID-19 grants um, was just based on a 100% uh, increase in uptake on grants from the last uh, full financial year. Uh, so we don't know how much, well, how accurate that will be. Um, but I think it's fairly safe to assume that by increasing the income threshold and therefore widening the eligibility, uh, that we would. Uh, probably spend more in terms of uh, awarding both loans and grants. Uh, it, it has been uh, challenging to try and put the figures so quickly, so honestly we don't have reliable estimates of how much that would potentially cost. We do have budgetary controls within the discretionary support scheme. Uh, all awards are discretionary, of course, um, and we do have the legal powers within the regulations uh, to control those payments later in the financial year if the budget is under pressure and no further money is available. Okay, thank you. Essentially, and it, I think what that means is that we're going to be monitoring the pay payments on this very, very carefully. And if we think there's any trouble with it, we look at it again. Okay, yeah. just just another thing. I know you've you've both been listening in since the beginning of the, the committee started, and you you heard us raise the issue to do, to do with universal credit and people who are having to wait um, a, a, an awfully long time to receive their first payment of universal credit. I suppose then uh, when we, we, we look at the discretionary support, um, are you able to give us any um, information on how someone, how length, or, uh, what the length of time it would be um, for someone to receive um, a, a discretionary support payment? Well, as far as I'm aware, um, and I'm, I'm talking from memory here, I think it's around about 90% of claims are processed and paid within two days. Okay. Uh, obviously, the department has introduced a, an online um, claim form. The claim form itself is online. Uh, the claims can be uh, completed and emailed in for the COVID-19 grant. Um, I have been told by our operational colleagues uh, that there has been, I mean, in the last few weeks, um, we have had, just to start listening to the figures here, on the 16th of March, the 1st of April, 292 people uh, have access to contingency fund payment, which of course is paid under discretionary support as well. So when there, if there is an increase in people going on to universal credit, they can access the contingency fund if they're not directly infected by the COVID-19 um, virus, and that is there. And we would, I, the, certain, the last figures that I have, the majority of those cases are cleared within two days. Clearly we have a challenge with staffing as well, and the department is redeploying staff uh, I understand there was five new teams trained in discretionary support just last week. Um, so the department is prioritising universal credit and discretionary support to try and ensure that the money gets out to people as quickly as possible. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know in the room, Johnny, it's, uh, uh, asked a question. It's a follow up to your question, Chair. So I think you mentioned was it 292 uh, claimants so far? Was that the correct figure? Yeah, just give my finger. Yes, that was for the contingency fund, yeah. and that was for the two-week period from the 16th of March to the 1st of April. And, and do you have um, any indication of what, how much the average claim is? 
Um, I know we paid out maybe eight thousand pounds for those uh, uh, people, and if you just give me, uh, I think the average award is in the region of um, just checking here three hundred and seventy one. Sorry, I no, didn't get that. No, the, the average, yeah, the average contingency fund payment is three hundred seventy nine pounds. Okay, thank you. So that's for people who who claim you see. Okay, uh, Kelly. Just um, this, I'm confused, so I don't know how the public out there are feeling about this. The contingency fund, you're saying the average payout is £379. What's the difference in the contingency fund then and this discretionary mm -hmm. support payment? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if I'm looking at this and going, if I'm applying for universal credit and I can go for the contingency fund and there's discretionary fund, mm -hmm. you know, how's the communications going out for people to explain the difference? The discretionary fund COVID one is specifically related to COVID, where you or a member of your family have been advised to self-isolate or where you have the, uh, the virus yourself or somebody in the household has the virus. So that's the, the discretionary support contingency or the discretionary support COVID grant. Yes. Then the contingency fund is the original contingency yes. fund, which was there if you were in, in crisis, but it's not related to COVID. But the, 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 Can I just explain the number two? Yeah, uh, I'll explain the calculation of both payments is effectively done the same way. Yeah. We calculate the number of days from the person who makes the claim until their next income is due, uh, and it's calculated based on the uh, personal allowances uh, under universal credit and any child elements. Now, if somebody's claiming a contingency fund payment, they are likely to then be claiming uh, for up to five weeks. So then payments will generally be larger. Somebody claiming under a COVID-19 grant may well have been waiting on payment of ESA, for example, or uh, statutory sick pay or something like that, which could come through in a couple of weeks. So those payments uh, would be less. The, 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 the big difference here is the COVID-19 grant, there is no limit to the number of those we can pay. The contingency funds, there's only one can be paid in a rolling 12 months. So I understand it may appear confusing um, for claimants the, the key message would be that they should, if they need emergency financial support, to contact discretionary support and the department will figure out which is the best payment for them. Well then, can I just ask on the communications then, how are you going to make this clear? Because the concession or the contingency fund was like the best kept secret um, for quite a long time. I'm just worried that if somebody phones up um, and they're asking for support, is there a clear communications on what exactly is available for people? Because I know that you know, we have heard other officers saying that the contingency fund was a limited pot of money, therefore it wasn't being promoted as much. The discretionary support amendment number two has been indicated that it may well be a limited pot of money. So how are we going to communicate that to people to let them have access to this money in, in crisis? Yeah, sorry, I think we're just, I'm just breaking up a bit at the end there. But in terms of communications, we do have information on both uh, both on, or, sorry, on discretionary support on the contingency fund and on the COVID-19 grant available in NI Direct. Uh, I'm certainly happy to take it back and, and speak to other officials uh, about the, the communications. I think it's just uh, whenever, we can do more on that. I think it's just whenever whenever anybody phones through, you know, all these words, um, it's how that can, that can be easily conveyed to people who are in crisis because when someone's in crisis, the detail tends to go out the window and they just need help. And it's just to make sure that... Yeah, I'll, yeah thank you. Yeah, oh. that's fine. I, I, I will speak to other officials in the department about that. Okay, I'm going to go to the telephones now, and I'm going to work in this order. I'm going to do Robin, Sinead, Fra, Carol, and Mark. So, Robin, have you any questions on this you want to ask? No, I, I, I'm, I'm content that uh, what the uh, communities are doing in, in making of this statutory okay. route is, is, in fact, uh, genuinely required. They, we are in a non presented situation, so very supportive of the work that's undertaken. Thank you, Robin. Sinead? No, I'm content, sir. Thank you. Fra? Sure. Uh, yes, just a, just a couple of uh, uh, questions. Uh, and it's about the uh, applications that have been made. Uh, it's my understanding that there are, uh, if people are doing online uh, applications, there are some systems that don't connect the, the likes of Apple uh, and an iPod or phone, mm -hmm. uh, that they can't make an application through there. Uh, is that right? And secondly, and uh, probably as important, 
the, uh, sometimes we, we, we forget that uh, people that work in the department are human also, and uh, the pressure that they are under, especially uh, with increased numbers. And uh, just a, 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 we can get just a wee uh, rundown on, uh, on how staff are coping uh, with the, the increases in, uh, with, in, 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 in apl applications. Okay, thank you, Tra. Yeah, on, on the, uh, the technical side, I have to admit, I wasn't aware of any uh, technical issues, but it's certainly something I, I will take up with uh, uh, some of the more IT literate people in our department. Sorry, I'm not really uh, uh, in a position to answer that one. Uh, maybe Anne can answer the second one. I think in relation to the pressure on staff, we're all keenly aware of that. Uh, a lot of people are working from home where that's possible, like in fact David and myself today. Um, the staff working in DS, we've had, we've had a lot of people trained on it, and I think a lot of the staff are feeling that they are making a big contribution to society at the minute and trying to help people out and taking a pride in what they're, they're doing. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, in-house psychologists that we have, and they have produced um, a number of aids for us all. Um, which are available to all, which are to do with mindfulness and just taking bre breaks and um, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of work going on. We are very mindful of the fact that the, st that the frontline staff uh, and also the backroom staff, to be honest, but that particularly the frontline staff are, are under pressure at the minute. And we're aware of that and working with them to try and make things as easy as possible. But yeah, we take that back, and I'll pass that those comments on. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, just a little bit can be passed on that we we, we do appreciate the work that, that's been done. Well, that's very much appreciated because while I think we've all seen, we've all been out out in the on the streets, uh, clapping on Thursday nights at eight o'clock. I think that sometimes I know whenever I go out, I'm going out, and I'm thinking of in particular our frontline staff who are there as well. Yeah. Uh, because I think that it's both a health issue but also an economic issue and we're right there at the front end in relation to the ec economics of all of us. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Carol. Carol, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Carol, um, any comment? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so, like Kelly, um, I had concerns around the difference between the discretionary support and the contingency. and. Even though it's on NI Direct, David, if we could just have a breakdown um, sent to the committee, because we're, the MLAs are often, even for our own councillors and colleagues, we're often the first people that they come to, particularly those of us that's on this committee. So I'd appreciate that. Um, and again, just to, just to repeat the, the, the statement that Fra has made in relation to staff, I mean, the Minister, Georgie, has finished off on that, but I think every one of us in this committee want to send our appreciation as well. Yep. The other issue that I just want to kind of just clarify, um, we, you would have heard the discussion about students at the start and Mark introduced those EU nationals outside of EU um, asylum seekers and refugees. So in relation to students, which of the funds would you recommend that they access? If possible. Okay. Well, it, it, uh, uh, Carl and I are sorry. Yeah, I should explain. Normally, under discretionary support, students in full time uh, third level education are excluded. Under yeah. the current uh, under the current public health crisis, uh, we uh, the department and minister has officially identified it. The purposes of discretionary support as a disaster, and that means that they are eligible, provided that uh, the the reason they're claiming is related to COVID nineteen. Now, if they are claiming universal credit, um, then, then the, the likelihood is that the best bet would be to actually claim a contingency fund payment. Um, or if they're, or if they're linked, or, uh, sorry, if they're affected by COVID-19 directly, then I would recommend that they claim that grant. The reason, the main difference is, let me explain earlier, for the COVID-19 grant is there is no limit in the number of those we can award. We can, if we give somebody a contingency fund payment, for example, it is a non-repayable grant, but you can only get that for them prevent you from getting another award in the following 12 months. Um, basically, students, as long as they are affected by COVID-19 in some way, then they will be able to access discretionary support, uh, just as anybody else would uh, during the current crisis. Um, but I really don't to get the COVID-19 run, they would have to be directly affected by it, i.e. infected 
or uh, self-isolating or so, any person in their immediate family doing so. Um, and that may be the best option for them. It really does depend. I mean, as I said, the calculation of the payments is exactly the same. It's just with one, you're allowed to access multiple grants and the other, there's only one grant in 12 months. Paula, can I come back? Yes, to certainly. Go ahead, Carol. So, um, David, I appreciate that. And it's clear, even from today, I've actually received more clarity that if you fall under the circumstances that you've out, outlined in relation to the statutory rule, that you're best written in for the discretionary route rather than the contingency front route. But you'll also know that, um, not particularly in relation to the categories that were mentioned, they mightn't fall into any of these. So are, is there work done with the Department of Economy officials in relation to increasing the student hardship funds? Because they may be isolated because they can't go to work. They're now isolated because of a public health crisis because the advice is not to move. Um, so, and we're, we don't wanna, we don't wanna wink and nod over this. We wanna give people clear information. So um, I'm not being pedantic, it's just that we are being asked um, and will continue to be asked what is the most um, reasonable route that people should um, pursue. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm certainly very happy to put uh, something together to the committee to explain the difference. Um, I'm personally not aware of any um, work ongoing on the hardship fund. I don't know, Anne, if you have any? I know that the department, as I think, I think you heard Minister saying that she was having a, a discussion later on this afternoon about hardship. Um, so this might form part of that, but I have a feeling it's perhaps a broader hardship issue, but we will be looking at it. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Did you finish, Carl? Yeah? Yes, it's just, if I can just do a wee follow up question to that and also what Kelly had brought up earlier, um, because for the, the likes of students, if we take them for example, um, so the, the, this that we're discussing here, the COVID-19 um, discretionary support, you have to either be self-isolating or someone is uh, are, are, are looking after someone in your family, I suppose, as well, who has been diagnosed. So, uh, you know, there, if you've simply lost your job or um, your income has reduced, that does not fall under this. This is specifically for people affected. Isn't that correct? Right. The, the, the income threshold in the, the new uh, and the amendment number two regs will open up access to discretion to uh, all elements of discretion support. So for example, if somebody has um, just lost their job and they find themselves with no income, they won't be able to apply for the COVID-19 grant, but they can apply just the discretion support generally for living expenses. Okay. And I know this might seem rather complicated um, in that we almost have multiple brands of the same payment, but it's it, it's just to try and, uh, obviously with the COVID-19 grant that I've explained, it allows us to pay more but if you're just have lost your job uh, or your income has reduced and it's below the new income threshold and you find yourself in a crisis situation, I would encourage anybody to claim for discretionary support. Um, we will try and provide more clarity, certainly. But I, I would encourage people to claim and then the department will be able to uh, determine which is the best route for them. Um, that support will be there for people if, they're in, if they have just lost their job uh, and they're not directly affected by COVID-19 other than losing their job and they find themselves in a crisis situation, they can't apply for discretionary support. Okay. And if they satisfy the criteria, they will get a payment, and those payments can be for living expenses. Uh, but it also opens up the potential to get grants for items and things like that. OK, look, thank you for just yeah, clearing that sure. up in my own head. Sure, can I, can I uh, just come in on the back of that? Yes, Fra, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, 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 again, uh, I think there, 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 there's just a couple of things on it. Uh, first of all, that uh, any information goes out that there is that it's kept as short as possible preferably one later so that people can pick up on it and uh secondly the uh and and relating to a number of other departments and agencies so like say nie ni water uh, esa there is an elected reps number uh that allows the uh, di di direct access thing uh, with uh, universal credit and others it's almost impossible for elected reps to get through has there been any uh, discussion and around providing a number that would allow us to, to more easily deal with our constituents when we're 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 phoning and on their behalf. 
Good question. Fra, it's Anne here. Uh, not that I'm a, not that I'm aware of, but that would really be something that my operational colleagues would be working on. I can refer that back and get you an answer on that. Okay, I'll thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, um, any comments from you? I, I, thank you, Chair. I was happy enough to be going and last today because if Kelly and Kyle are confessing to being confused by the, the, the situation, I don't think there's any shame at all in, in me admitting to being so as well. So certainly if, if committee members, indeed maybe all, uh, 90 MLAs yeah. could be provided with some sort of ready reckoner to help uh, us best advise people rather than us giving someone a wrong number them spending a couple of hours trying to get through the it, even to be told then that, 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 that they're barking up the wrong tree. I'd also uh, suppose like to be associated with the remarks that members have made about staff. They're doing a, a, a great job in ever-changing uh, circumstances, extremely difficult, and that's front line and uh, back room. Mm -hmm. But just um, in terms of the, the, the staff and the increased workload, being tied by potentially, if not already, a depleted uh, workforce. Are there contingency plans there? I think you referred to banking staff, but I know there have already been some issues around agency staff uh, in, in, in the own constituency. Uh, is there enough in terms of demand power, uh, the, particularly given the complexity of some of the queries that, that are going to be coming through? Well, Mark, obviously I'm on the policy side, not the ops yes. side, but from what I'm seeing, I know that staff from areas that are quieter are being redeployed across into the focused areas, which are UC and DS. Uh, and as David has said, there's been training ongoing. At least I think it was David said there has been training ongoing in the last week for the staff moving mm -hmm. into DS. So um, we're making, we're trying to make the best use of the resource that we've got and also trying to look ahead because the staff who are fitting well today may not be fitting well you know, yeah. next week, the following week. So we have to have contingency plans there as well. And as far as I understand, the, my operational colleagues have been working very hard on that. And as I said as well, when I was uh, speaking to, I think it was Fran mentioned it originally, um, there is there is help there, and as I say, the fact that we happen to have psychologists in the department has been very useful because they've been able to provide a kind of online uh, information and online advice uh, in relation to those who are who are finding the, the going a bit tough. Because I think that they're very. very how, how do we get access to them? <laughs> I don't know. I, well, put it like this: if you if you want me to pass that back, I'll I'll pass it on. I think actually these are the same psychologists who give advice for uh, our cus customers as well. So uh, you just wouldn't know. They might be available all round. We might do a, another business in relation to that. Okay. Thanks, Anne. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Andy. You want to? Sure. Come? Just very quickly, and and on Kelly's comment and Mark's, um, I'm aware that the department did put out a um, small graphic on social media um, a few weeks ago, prior to the COVID-19 fund, uh, which which does outline the process in claiming for financial support, and maybe it's useful for that to be updated yes. to include the COVID-19 fund. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's okay. certainly something we can look at. Yep. yep, sounds like a good idea. Mm. Okay, and David, can I very much thank you for your assistance here today to the committee, and if you could then please take back on behalf of all of the committee um, our, our thanks to all of those people within the department at, in whatever capacity um, they are within the department, because we know it takes uh, many people in order to keep this machine moving. Um, so please pass on our, our heartfelt thanks and gratitude to them. We will indeed. That's fine. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, now. Okay, members, um, uh, can I just then ask, firstly, in Anne the... McCleary. I'll let them disappear first. Has left the conference. Oh. David Tarr. There we go. Has left the conference. Do you think that's us ready now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Members, first of all, can I ask within the room, um, are members content that this rule be made? Agreed. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Members on the phone, are you also content the rule be made? Yes? Agreed. Thank you very much. 
Then we'll move on to our next item of business, which is agenda item number 10, SR 2020-27, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors, Northern Ireland Order 2020. The committee considered the SL1 for this order at its meeting on the 5th of March and was content. Can I ask if members who have dialed in, have they any objections to the rule? No. 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 Thank you. Members in the room, any objections to the rule? No. Okay, then I read into the record that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-27, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors, Northern Ireland Order 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item 11, SR 2020-28, the Pension Protection Fund. An occupational pension scheme, levy, ceiling, and compensation cap order, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the committee considered the SL1 for this order at its meeting of the 5th of March and was content. Can I ask uh, members who have dialed in, have they any objection to the rule? No. 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 Thank you. Members in the room, any objection to the rule? No. Nope. Okay, I'll read into the record then that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-28, the Pension Protection Fund, an Occupational Pension Scheme, Levy Ceiling and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. I'll move, in, move on then, members, to Agenda Item 12, which is SR 2020-30. The Occupation and Personal Pension Schemes General Levy Amendments Regulations. The Committee considered the SL1 for these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March and was content. Can I ask members who have dialed in, are you uh, any objections to this rule? No. 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 Thank you. No. Members in the room, any objections to the rule? No. No. Okay, then I'll read into the record that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-30. The Occupational and Pensions and Personal Pension Schemes General Levy Amendments Regulations and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. I'll move in, then on to item agenda number 13, SR 2020-35, the Guaranteed Minimum Pensions Increase Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The committee considered the SL1 for these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March and was content. The department has advised that there have been no policy changes since then. Can I ask members who have dialed in if there any objection to the rule? No. 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 Thank you. Members in the room, any objection to the rule? No. Okay, I'll read in then as follows that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-35, the Guaranteed Minimum Pensions Increase Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item number 14, which is SR 2020-36, the mesothelioma, lump sum payments, conditions and amounts amendment regs, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the committee considered the SL1 for these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March and were content. Can I ask again, members who have dialed in, any objections to the rule? No. no. Members no. in the room, any objections to the rule? You're getting good at that word. <laughs> Thank you. No, <laughs> no objections. objections. I'll read into the record then that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-36, the mesothelioma, lump sum payments, conditions and amounts, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item 15, SR 2020 number 37, the statutory sick pay general coronavirus amendment number two regs, Northern Ireland 2020. Member, these reg members, these regulations came into force on the 19th of March in breach of the 21 day rule. They were made in urgency to ensure that people who self isolated in accordance with government advice and are therefore incapable of work um, are entitled to statutory sick pay. As guidance continues to be updated, the regulations may also need to be updated. Can I ask members who have dialed in if they have any objections to this rule? No. 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 Thank you. Members in the room, no. any objections no. to the rule? No. No. Okay, then I'll read the following into the record that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020 number 37, the statutory sick pay general coronavirus amendment number two regs, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no Who's objections there? to the rule. Who's there? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, we'll move on. It's obviously somebody is at someone's door there. Uh, we'll move on then to agenda item 16, isn't that correct? That's, that's my children, sorry about that. That's, <laughs> that's a BBC <laughs> News moment there, Mark. That's quite okay, Mark. We're bursting in a wheelie. I'll put you back on. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. That's why we use the mute button whenever you're not talking. Um, we'll move on to agenda item 16, isn't that correct? I found the right one. Yeah. Um, uh, which is uh, 2020 40, the Social Security Benefits Operating Order, Northern Ireland 2020. Yeah. yeah. The committee considered this SL1 um, for these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March and was content. Can I ask members who have dialed in if there are any objection to this rule? No, content. No. Grant, thank you. Members in the room, any objection to the rule? No. no. What about your daughter, Mark? Any objections to the rule? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have you back on. <laughs> Okay, we'll put the question then that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 202040, the Social Security Benefits Operating Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it will that it be confirmed by the Assembly. We'll move on then to agenda item 17, SR 2020 number 41, the Social Security Benefits Operating Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The committee considered the SL1 for these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March and was content. Um, members again that have dialed in, any objection to the rule? No. no. Content. Thank you. Members in the room, any objection to the rule? No. Nope. nope. Okay, I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020 number 41, the Social Security Benefits Operating Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Okay, members, we'll just move on then to agenda item 18, which is SR 2020-45, the Employment and Support Alliance and Housing Benefit Transitional Provisions Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Members, you'll be aware that a number of claimants migrated from a range of benefits to ESA. As a result, some claimants had an ESA award less than their previous award. To compensate for the, this, claimants were awarded a transitional award. This was meant to cease on the 5th of April, when it was expected that the transitional payment would have reduced as benefits increased. However, transitional awards did not reduce as much as forecast, as the number estimated to be receiving a transitional award in 2020 is higher than forecast. The end date of April 2020 is no longer appropriate. This amendment allows the protection of transitional awards to continue until naturally reduced to nil. The ESA claim is closed. Our claim, the ESA claim is closed. Our claims are migrated to universal credit. Can I ask members um, on dial-up any objection to the rule? No. no. Members in the room, any objection to the rule? No. Nope. Okay, I'll put the question then that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-45, the Employment and Support Alliance and Housing Benefit Transitional Provisions Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Agenda item 18, SR 2020-49. No. 19. 19. I can't say properly, thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness, we're nearly there. Agenda item 19, SR 202049, 49 the Occupational Personal Pension Scheme General Levy. Revocation. Revo What's that, sir? Revocation. Revocation regs, NI 2020. Bear with me, folks. <laughs> it's a lot. The committee considered the SL1 for these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March and was content. Can I ask members that have dialed in any objection to the rule? No, content. Content. No. Thank you. Members in the room? 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 Content. Content. Thank you. Okay, I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-49, the Occupational Pension Scheme, General Levy, Revocation Regs, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agenda item 20 is SR 2020-51, the Automatic Enrolment Earnings Trigger and Qualifying Earnings Band Order Northern Ireland 2020. The committee considered this as SL1 um, of these regulations at its meeting on the 5th of March also. Can I ask members and dial up any objection to the rule? No, content. Thank you. Members in the room? Content. 
Thank you. Um, then I'll put forward that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-51, the automatic enrolment earnings trigger and qualifying earnings band order Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, we're now moving on to agenda item 21, which is correspondence. Um, correspondence memo is at page 191 of your meeting packs. Can I draw members' attention to item 21.4, which is an invitation to visit and hold an external committee meeting at Burren GAA Club, um, County Down. Um, members will know if accepted to hold um, meetings or to pay a visit to Kingspan Stadium and Windsor Stadium. And um, we have also considered holding a meeting at, or I was going to say playing, or paying a visit <laughs> to GAA uh, location. Are members in the room content to visit and or hold a meeting um, in the future um, at Burren GAA? Albeit, um, we know that that's probably not likely that we're holding any outside meetings until sort of certainly summer re after summer recess. So are members content with that? Content. Okay. Okay. Okay, members. Yes. Um, can I ask then, firstly, members in the room, um, is there anything um, they want to bring to my attention from the correspondence? Anything else? No? Okay, members on dial-up, have you anything you want to bring to attention from the correspondence memo? No. So can I ask then, is everybody then content with the correspondence memo? Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Go ahead, Andy. Can I be an awkward and comment? Can we? I know we're in unprecedented times, and the department are focused on other things. Can we just ask for an update on the charities commission uh, aspects, yeah. uh, where we are in relation to the previous court ruling, uh, and declare an interest in respect to that as a charity trustee? And, okay. And on thank the you, Chair. On the back of that, I, I think I did raise at the last communities meeting in which we sat that when. T the time is appropriate, and I understand it's not appropriate at the moment with circumstances, that we invite the Charities Commission to come along to this committee to give evidence in relation to that court ruling and uh, other outfoldings of the uh, Charity Commission. Yeah. Okay, members, that's great. That's okay. Thank you. Anything else any other member wants to bring up to do with correspondence? Nope. Okay, no. I'll move on then to agenda item 22, which is AOB. Um, firstly, ask Dalop any. Any other business? Any of you want to highlight? No other no. business. Nope. Happy enough. Okay, members in the room. Any other business? Nope. No, okay. Chair, just yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Chair. It would be good, even just, although it's probably noted, but it'd be good for us to put a letter to the Department of Community, to the Minister and all indeed all the staff, our gratitude at their at their work during this. Um, on unprecedented health crisis, health and economic crisis. Absolutely agreed. I, I think that would be a very good idea, Carl. Yep, happy to do that. Yeah, all members agreed. 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 Okay. Um, okay, then, if there's nothing else, we'll move on then to agenda item 23, which is date, time, and location for our next meeting. Can I advise you that the next committee meeting is scheduled to take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 23rd of April, in room 29? And of course, this is subject to confirmation um, given the present circumstances. Can I thank everybody, all of the staff, all of the techie people, everybody today, for helping us get through this meeting? And I have Agreed. declared the meeting closed. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. 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 Thank you.